Latasha Brown, um, co-founder of Black Voters Matter. When you talk about deep organizing, most of us don't even have a clue what that looks like, right? I know that you're responsible for millions of people being registered to vote over the last four years, right? Registering to vote. Is it not door knocking, showing up on campuses? Like what, like, and for those people who want to get into the deep organizing, help them understand what's required of them and what it looks like. You know, I can, Karen, I can talk about the mechanics of organizing. Um, and there's a need for that, for people to actually know that there is a skill around being able to organize and to get people um, um, to be engaged. Um, and that's the, the, the canvassing and the GOTV work, whether it's doing voter registration, whether that's canvassing, which is door knocking, whether that's peer-to-peer -peer conversations with the text messaging campaign, all of that. We do all of that, right? Um, I can also talk about getting people engaged around the issues that they care about. You know, there are some people that care about criminal justice reform. There are some people that are care about economic, um, uh, the economic issues. There are people that care about health care. And so it's really important as you're organizing that you are literally listening to people to hear what it is that they care about. So you're making a connection with what it is they care about and how voting and, um, um, and participating in the process makes a difference. So I also can talk about how it is important for us to really recognize that sometimes you're not gonna get everything that you want in voting, right? But sometimes you gotta use voting as a harm reduction strategy, right? That there, that to prevent mm -hmm. harmful policy from impacting your community, right? That will actually do destructive things. And so you have to use it as a harm reduction strategy or even using it as to advance a particular kind of policy need, whether it's getting more resources in your community, all those things. And I'm quite sure people have heard most of those things before. The one thing that I wanna say that I don't think that we talk about a lot, um, the one thing, and in some ways, because it is not, you know, you can't get your arm around it. We're not talking about it. I think the most powerful tool in organizing is believing. And this is what I mean, that yes, we could do all the other stuff, but black folks got to believe in our power and our agency to transform that in spite of racist systems, in spite of other barriers that we have to use every single tool that is available for us to be able to transform our community and this nation to the nation we desire and that we deserve. And so what I have found is the most profound thing that can transform to get people to get involved in elections, to get people to create businesses, to get create the people to be a is that we've got to believe in something greater than what we see already. We've got to believe in something. We got to believe our children deserve better. When you believe your children deserve better, you will fight like hell to make sure your kids get better. When you believe that you're supposed to be treated a certain kind of way, you're not going to tolerate people treating you a certain kind of way. You're not going to like, let white nationalist races take over the government when you believe that your community right, has the right, has the agency, and has the power to do something about it. And so I, we don't talk about that a lot because that for, for many people that sounds more amorphous. But the truth of the matter is that I think one of the most powerful tools that, you, that we can use to advance ourselves or the most powerful tool to keep us back is based on our belief. If we mm. believe we can't change nothing, nothing won't get changed. If you believe that you don't matter, nothing will nothing, nothing would matter. I will tell you the difference between someone who just talk about it and those that do something about it is that those that do something about it have something that propels them to do something. That is, they believe. They have the audacity of 600 people on the Elmer Pettis Bridge in Selma, Alabama that did not have government on their side. Both political parties were, were racist. They had a president that called and told them, do not go down, do not march. Matter of fact, they even had convinced SCLC and Dr. King and them that they were not going to march. They needed to wait. Those 600 people had the audacity to believe, to believe that what they were doing was going to change the course of America. They knew that they were going to be met at the end of that bridge with dogs and billy clubs. They knew that. Right, but they had a belief in their own agency, not in the federal government, not in what uh, these systems. They believe that them standing and fighting for what they be fighting for their agency, fighting to participate in the process, that it would be transformative. And what we know 
is those are facts. It was. And so I just hope that people in this moment that are listening to me, if they don't listen to anything else, yes, I'll be glad to teach you the mechanics around voting and GOTV. And there are many organizations to do that. And I can talk about the steps of that. I'll, I'll be glad to really be able to share with you some of the models of what we're doing with our campaign. Because we got a campaign right now we call We Won't Black Down. Not, and you heard it right. Not <laughs> we, black down, we Won't Black Down, right? Come but on. I think the most critical mo piece for us in this moment, y'all, we got to believe. We got to believe that there is no system that we can't penetrate, change, abolish, replace, that we've got to believe that there is nothing that is acceptable for our community except the best. And when yes. you believe that, when you're tired, you get up and you work anyway. Come on, Latasha Brown, you know, given she always comes and gives a sermon as you were talking, I was also thinking, you know, the myth of whiteness and what we have always told, we, we tell ourselves these stories, they won't let us, you know, it starts with, they won't let us. And I'm like, who's they? <laughs> and, and why are you allowing them to not let you? And what is the thing that you want to do that they aren't letting you do? Like in our lives, we're always looking outside of ourselves for the reason why we aren't doing better. And to your point, you know, we have control. I have live in abundance. I have abundance. I deserve. I am all of that. You are all of that. So why do we allow for anything to stand in the way of the thing that we want to have happen in our lives, including electing people, sending people to Washington or sending people to the state house that will do our, this is the relationship, right? You have it's to do our, my vote. You do what I tell you to do. That's how this works, right? This but we don't even have an ask. We don't even know what it is that we want. Yeah, I, you know, I think we do. You know, Karen, in fairness, let me say this, because I, you know, I think that sometimes we underestimate how traumatic um, living in a racist society is. You know, just because we do it well, you know, just because we survive, just because we navigate it, you know, I, how many of us, are going to work every single day in an, an environment that we know is hostile and an environment that we know that our opinions, our contributions are not received like our white counterparts, going in an environment that we know we underpaid, in an environment that we are training somebody that actually we know that we should have their job, but because of who they are, we this has been our experience. That does not necessarily mean that we can't overcome that, nor does it mean that that experience doesn't exist. And I'm saying that because part of what we have to recognize is that that there is, and that's why we have to lift each other up. Sometimes I'm, I'm feeling like, I'm like, oh, can we do this? And then that's why my, my movement friends or my movement comrades, I surround myself with folks that when I'm weak, they're going to hold my shoulder up like, come on, girl, I got you today, right? And then the next day I hold them. So I think in this moment, if there are two things that I, I can just share, like in this moment, whenever there is fierce opposition, it cre always creates vast opportunity. Listen to what I'm saying. Whenever there's fierce opposition, it creates a moment, a space for opportunity, vast opportunity. In this moment, where this democracy that we know full of flaws, that has not been inclusive, that has not been fully representative, that has been racist, that is while it is on the table, come on y'all, let's push forward. Since we are on the table, let's push forward. Let's push to make sure that we have an expanded Supreme Court, a Supreme Court that is actually gonna be reflective of America. Let's push for the either abolishment or the, of the, of the Senate, or that we literally get the Senate right size. That when you look at the Senate right now, they don't look like us. Matter of fact, they're not the age of the majority of Americans, nor are they the demographics. There's not enough women on there. How it is that women are the majority of this country and we're grossly, grossly under, under, un, underrepresented in every single position. I'm saying this because there is an amazing opportunity in this moment, right? When everything is on the table, right? They have taken, they have, they have taken the hoods out of the closet and let us see them. We see mm -hmm. in the hoods in plain sight right now. We're seeing the vote, the suppression in plain sight right now. This is the moment that you go hard in the paint. This is the moment that when your team come out on the court, you like, all right, we got a couple of minutes down. Well, come on, let's get it. So this is the moment for us to really recognize that under no circumstances can we allow white supremacy or a party that aligns itself with white nationalists to prosper, not nary an inch. They can't gain any ground, y'all. In addition to that, does that mean that we're going to get everything that we need from, from, 
the Democratic Party? No, it doesn't. But we also can't create false equivalences acting like they're the same because they are not the same. They're not the same party. There's not the same people. In this moment, what we have to really be able to do is to really organize ourselves, build infrastructure in our community, and get involved and have an engagement that's not about a political party or a candidate, but it's really about our us literally standing around power. This ain't about participation. This is about straight up raw power. And when you want power, you go get it. We've got to go get it. It is on the table. Voting is one tool. Economic power is one tool. Social power is one tool. We've got many tools, but when we're in a fight like we're in right now, we've got to use every single tool available for us so that we can advance our community. And I do believe that it is, while it is really, really hard, right? I do believe there's a unique opportunity that has been opened up that in the midst of where there's fierce opposition, there's always vast opportunity. Mm. 866-801-8255. Latasha Brown, I've, I've been saving this question for you uh, since I've been seeing all of the, the noise and nonsense. But Atlanta's own, Killer Mike, Mike Rinder, uh said some things that it, it feels almost like I, I don't want to accuse him of being paid a paid operative because I'm not sure where he's coming from, but it, it is hurtful. It's as hurtful as Kanye West saying, you know, white men are the most uh, oppressed people in this country. It's like hurtful. It's hurtful and it's discouraging and it's disconcerting. And I don't I don't know how well, you know, Mike, but it feels like it undermines what you're doing. Not, not only it feels like it, it does. I mean, I've canvassed with that brother before. You know, I think part of what winds up happening and, and we just don't have to be honest with this. We have literally given the pursuit of freedom away for this pursuit of money. And if you think that money of power away from money, and let me say what I mean by that, you know, it's interesting because you, I'll talk to folks and everybody was like, well, you know, you got, you got money, you got power, do you? Right. At, at the end of the day, you better get some power and some money is, is an access to power. Right. But I'm, I'm, I'm raising that because I think it's really important because there are people who have gotten money and, and because they've gotten money, they can't talk. They can't hang with certain folk. They can't say certain things. Right. So the, it becomes a particular kind of space. Why am I bringing this up with Killer Mike? Because I think, you know, part of what let me just say this about the brother, what he did at best was disingenuous. The bottom line is if you know anything about um, black entrepreneurs in this country right now, let me be clear. The majority of, 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 of entrepreneurs or people who are starting small businesses in this country right now happen to be black women, percentage wise over any other constituency group, but, it, but, but are black women. How you gonna have a serious meeting with the governor in Buckhead out of all of the communities in Georgia, okay. right? with 50 black men, come on, bro. That wasn't even representative of our community. So number one, let's start there. Number two, let's start with, for our community, biz, when we talking about money, we gotta talk about all aspects, right? You can't just, you can't um, pay me a salary. That's like giving somebody a raise, but not making an adjustment for the, for the cost of living. At the end of the day, it is, it's, it's, we don't just need businesses. We need flourishing businesses. We need access to health care. We need to make sure that we've got quality education. Let's talk about, since we want to talk about money, and, I'm, and, and Killer Mike is saying, you know, he got this attachment of saying that he's been good at business. Well, how's he been good at business when this man literally, I'm going to go, and he's been good, he's good, he's talking good at business. Do you know in the state of Georgia, where Black folks make 30% of the population, we get less than 1% of the state contracts? Now that's, Brian Kip got had four years to do that. If he was serious about, we get, I need people to hear me. We receive black, uh, black businesses receive less than 1% of, 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 of the business for the state of Georgia, of the billions of dollars that we spend in the state. But then we gonna, we gonna have one meeting with him with 50 black men and some whatever they had over there and Buckhead and he gonna smile and we don't hold him accountable on that. In addition to that, healthcare, here it is in the state of Georgia. There's been six hospitals that have closed, Karen. We're actually on the verge of a seventh hospital closing in Metro Atlanta, right? 
that impacts working class people, not just having healthcare access, but who you think working at those hospitals that shuts down jobs, that impacts businesses. In many of those communities, it's had a devastating impact, economic impact on those communities. But guess why those hospitals have closed? Those hospitals have closed because Brian Kemp refuses to expand ACA or Medicaid or Obamacare because it was attached to Obama. There's over a billion dollars that is sitting there, federal dollars that we can get access to if he expanded. That's bad for business. That's totally bad for the business of black folk. So when we get real tunnel vision about whether it is that maybe he want him to get some more money for his barbershop, I don't know, right? But when we get yeah. real tunnel vision, that is really about our individual visual capacity and not about the collective harm and damage that that this man has done to our community and then we, let's not even talk about voting rights and the hundreds of thousands of black voters that he is at, he took off the voting rolls when he was secretary of state he has continued that policy well if he was a good for black business where was brian kemp when when they were signing the voter suppression bill when he was sitting up under a picture of a plantation flanked by eight white men so the bottom line for us to rubber stamp that, no, there's nothing that Killer Mike can say that would make that behavior be okay. That to say that that is okay. And so it is damaging and it is irresponsible. And we can still love our brother and call our brother to the carpet, right? Because at the end of the day, what we are seeing is that Republicans, and we have seen this often, where the Republicans have no, they don't, they don't even think twice about exploiting black pain and black discontent because they they also don't feel any kind of responsibility to provide any relief or remedy. Don't exploit my pain and you're not providing any remedy. He, in where he's had power to do, he has not done that. And so I raise that because I think it's really dangerous. You know, I'm so tired of them. Every time they want it, they go, they get a rapper and say, uh, or somebody, an athlete, and all of a sudden that's supposed to be, uh, uh, that's supposed to validate who they are. His actions speak for him.